Um, and so here are some recommendations for those of you that are going to be going to outpatient. Um, if you are looking for a good hike, um, check out some trails in Crested Butte. If you want to see some wildflowers, let me know. If you have questions, I'm always happy to share with you. And then if you're interested in more water-based activities, you can kayak or rent a boat on Elk Creek Marina um, down in Denison. So things to look forward to this August as you guys wrap up your first block of inpatient medicine. Um, don't forget to sign on the QR code. Um, today's question is about passing along some recognition to a non-physician person that you've worked with um, this past month. So just give me their name and as much info as you have on their last name or what unit they work in and I'll pass along that information. Um, I know that for those of you who got those kind words from your colleagues last week, you all really appreciated it. And so feel free to pass it forward um, to someone that you've worked with. We'll play Jeopardy on Friday, um, lots of prizes. So make sure you review the boards from this past month. And then um, last but not least, Palisade peaches are in season. I almost drove off the highway in an effort to get my first one at someone who was selling them on a roadside stand. So be sure to find some. Um, they'll be at the farmer's markets um, throughout the season. Questions on any of this? Okay, let's jump into our case. Um, so today we are having a case titled Hickam's Dictum. So that's the idea that patients can have as many problems as they want. Um, and this guy definitely uh, followed that pattern. So I will read out um, this uh, one-liner for you. Ignore the code blue test for now. So we have a 69-year-old male. He has multiple medical problems, as you can see laid out in his past medical history. He was actually an outpatient, got some routine labs for, from his endocrinologist, and was called for a critical lab finding of a calcium level of 14. So he was told to go to the ER as soon as he could. For his past medical history, you guys can see there, um, multiple different issues, cardiac um, issues, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, set a history of Graves' disease, um, set a thyroid resection. He has hypoparathyroidism because of that, uh, CKD, a pulmonary nodule that's being monitored, MDUS. Um, he's had a cabbage and a thyroidectomy. For his social history, he's a former nurse, um, no real recreational drug use, uh, tobacco or alcohol use. He did smoke for a short period of time when he was in the service, but has quit for more than 15 years. He lives out on a ranch with his wife. And then you can see his medications there. Um, pretty standard for his heart failure regimen. He's on calcitriol for his hypoparathyroidism. And then just for you guys to take a note of, he's on Bumex 4 daily um, and Batolazone for his diuretics. And then he has three milligrams of Bumex he can take as needed if his weight is over his dry weight. Any questions on this one liner or his other data? You knew he was coming in, so you had some time to look in the chart and get ready. Okay, let's move on to our um, HPI. So the resident who admitted him said that he had been out of the hospital for about two weeks. He didn't have much of an appetite, um, has not been sleeping well, has been having a little bit more diarrhea than constipation, about three to four bowel movements a day. He feels like he's confused and the resident points out he forgets what he's going to say in the middle of a sentence and has to take kind of a pause. Um, feeling like he's having balance issues, um, no dysuria, no back pain, um, and he's been short of breath ever since he was in the hospital two weeks ago for a heart failure exacerbation. Has a slight cough, um, no nausea, no vomiting, no headaches, and just feels over the last two weeks he's been a little bit lightheaded. Um, can't remember how he's taking his metolazone, thinks it's maybe twice a day. And then he thinks he stopped his calcitriol, but he's not sure, says that we should check with his wife. Here are his vitals and his exam. So blood pressure is a little high. Um, he's at 90% on three liters, which is his baseline oxygen requirement. For his exam, a little bit of an abbreviated exam, uh, has some elevated JVD with ultrasound. He's breathing comfortably on his three liters. He's already oriented, occasionally loses a uh, train of thought. And then those are his ER labs. Um, obviously that calcium is abnormal. Uh, wasn't trying to hide that from you all since we knew he was coming in for that. Proven to be high with a high iCal. Um, and then he has a little bit of an AKI compared to his baseline, some hyponatremia, um, hypokalemia. And then these are the rest of his labs. Any questions or things that you guys want clarified so far for this patient? Okay, 
So um, what I want you to do is knowing his past medical history and his medications and all of his issues, chat with your tables and come up with um, at least three different causes of the etiology of his hypercalcemia. I'll give you guys about a minute and a half to talk through that. And then um, we'll go through each table. We'll start at this end of the room with James and Maggie and Erica's table um, and then work our way across the room. But three, diff three different um, differential diagnoses for his hypercalcemia. And if people on Zoom want to give me their differential, feel free to type it into the chat box. Okay, take it away. Yeah. for this guy and his hypercalcemia. Okay. Great. And which medications in particular are you worried about? Metolazone, okay. All right, let's go to table two here in the middle. Um, what did you guys think about? Pretty much the same stuff, more or less. Uh, a little bit more emphasis on like beds and also possibly like paper. Okay. Or even sarcoidosis. Great. Another question I have is this is crystal thing will be like the British or something. He's taking a multivitamin, but otherwise, no. Uh, extraneous like over-the-counter supplements or things like that. Right. Last table, anything different or anything else to add? Yeah, we talked about these, I think, or like a 
Okay, perfect. Great. Um, so a very good differential on everybody's part. Um, I don't know if this back area has different things that they talked about. Officially not a table, but okay. Um, so does somebody have a way that they think about? And Dr. Albert is saying, don't forget about simple dehydration as a cause of um, hypercalcemia. Um, does anybody have a good framework or a way they think about the differential diagnosis of hypercalcemia? Gland or kidney? Okay, so is it a PTH mediated process or not? Um, I think that is the way that most of us tend to think about hypercalcemia is to say, is it driven by someone's PTH or not? So if we have to categorize the differential that you guys put up, let's say we have PTH mediated, we have non PTH mediated, and then another category. Where would all of these fall? So his malignancy mediated by PTH or not? No. All right, what about medication use? Where would that fall? Okay. And then hypervitamin D? Other or technically non PTH, if you're supplementing it. Um, and then sarcoid lymphoma, all of our granulomatous diseases also fall into this category. Um, what causes PTH mediated hypercalcemia? I heard someone say it. Yep. So, adenoma of the parathyroid. Great. Okay, we will continue along with this, um, but let's get to our next question. So what free tests are you going to order to work up this patient's hypercalcemia? So he's coming in, he's fairly asymptomatic. Um, you know the history that he has. And so again, each table come up with at least three tests. It can be laboratory or other diagnostic testing. Um, and we will walk through any of those that we have. We'll start with uh, the table on this end, Sam's table, uh, when we come back. Take about a minute and a half. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right, so starting off with table one. Guys, we're going to come back together, okay? Um, so starting off with table one, um, what are three tests that you would order for this particular patient to work up his hypercalcemia? Okay. Okay. Great test. Table two, anything else that you would want? What kind of vitamin D level do you want? Perfect. <laughs> Great. And then table three, anything different that you guys would check? Remember, it doesn't have to just be labs. It could be anything that you want to do diagnostically for this guy. Think some pointing towards the chest. <laughs> what would you order? Okay, pan scan, CT. Okay. All right. So let's talk about each of these. I agree with all of these tests that you guys are interested in getting. Um, and I think that they all have their place. I'll point out that Dr. Albert says that given his um, metabolic disturbances, he says to give volume first as opposed to ordering any tests and see if it gets better. Just making sure you guys see his comments since he's on Zoom. Um, so when I think about hypercalcemia, my way that I think about the differential um, is intricately tied into how I think about the diagnostic workup of um, hyper or hypercalcemia. So I'm going to draw a little chart for you guys. So someone comes in with hypercalcemia. The first thing that I like to figure out is, is it PTH mediated or not, as you guys have astutely picked up on. So what's the PTH? If it is low, then we fall into one category. If it's low normal, we have a second. And then if it's high, I know it's something else. So if somebody has a high PTH level and they're hypercalcemic because of it, what's the diagnosis there? Adenoma, perfect. So they have uh, hyperparathyroidism. Okay, what happens if it's um, low or somewhat normal? Um, you know, remember that it should be completely suppressed if our calcium level is high. So there's one familial diagnosis that falls into this category. Yes. <laughs> Mike's got it. SHH, we'll abbreviate it as that, but familial uh, hypocalceric hypercalcemia. And so you would investigate their urinary calcium excretion to figure out what that is. Low is where it gets interesting because we know it's not a PTH mediated, uh, PTH mediated process. There's something else going on. Um, the one that I usually start off with is the PTHRP. So what does that stand for? Yeah, parathyroid hormone related protein. And what makes it? Cancer. Yeah, cancer. So we know if it's high, then this person has some sort of malignancy. If it's low, we're like, shucks, we really thought it was going to be that. What do we check next? Yep, we can check our vitamin D levels. And which one do you want to check first? Perfect, so 125. So we can check the 125 vitamin D level. So if it's high, what sorts of things produce extra activated vitamin D? Yep, sarcoid, lymphomas can also do it. What happens if it's low? Then what do we check? Uh, yep, we check a 25. And if that's high, you guys know? 
Yeah, yeah, ask them what they're taking. So it's usually a med effect. Um, they have they are over intoxicated with vitamin D. If it's low, then you can go down pathways for other things, um, things like hyperthyroidism um, or other issues like uh, milk alkali syndrome can also play a role into that. So that's how I think of or how I think of hypercalcemia. Um, so my diagnostics and my differentials are pretty much tied together hand in hand because I can walk through um, this table very easily. Questions on this part? Can, yeah. I, can I embellish some of that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Anna. How does the um, multiple myeloma hyperacidosis we... Great question. So a multiple myeloma will come in if they have a low vitamin D25, then you can send off your SPEP, your UPEP, and then if those are abnormal, you, know, you can make your diagnosis of myeloma. Um, so just a sort of way to think about this, you know, I'm, I'm just a hospitalist, like I'm a little bit of a simpleton, these sorts of like really big diagnostic tables where like everything under the sun might cause hypercalcemia, always give me a little bit of pause and I still have to look them up. So I think, you know, starting with PTH independent versus uh, dependent is really where I start thinking about it. But even before that, there are a couple of themes about hypercalcemia that I think are important to keep in mind, especially when you're taking care of these patients and, and figuring out who do I need to treat really urgently. Um, so number one is who is my patient? And by that, I mean, what is their age and what is their medical comorbidities? So folks who come in who tend to be younger, who tend to have less medical comorbid disease, tend to have primary hyperparathyroidism and modest elevations in their hypercalcy or in their calcium levels. Okay. Um, always remember you got to correct calcium, you got to look at the eye you got to correct it for albumin. You got to really know what the calcium is. Um, but often our younger folks come in with hyperparathyroidism, sort of modest elevations in, in uh in in, high, in calcium. Um, the folks that are more concerning are, are folks that are older, that are going to be 50s or greater, um, that might have multiple medical comorbidities and present with higher levels of calcium. Um, these are much more likely to be the PTH independently mediated things that are much more sinister. Um, you know, malignancy associated hypercalcemia, you know, uh, milk alkaloids, granulomatous disease, the weirder things that um, uh, can cause higher calcium. So that's, that's my, my first thought is who is my patient? How old are they? And what are their medical comorbidities? And then I just look at the absolute value of the calcium. So this guy's calcium is 14 when he checks in. So I think of the 10 to 12 range as sort of mild elevations as hypercalcemia. They may have some manifestations and symptoms, um, and we're going to treat them certainly, but I think it's, it's a little less concerning than somebody who comes in with the calcium of 14. That 12 to 14 range is sort of that moderate range where people are definitely going to be symptomatic. They might have renal injury. They might have some of these other things we're going to talk about, and we definitely need to figure out what's going on. When you get into 14 and above, this is where people can get into hypercalcemic crisis and do need fairly emergent management. So I think those are a couple of things that I would add to this sort of complex um, you know, uh, tree that we're working down, but are just like boots on the ground sort of tips that, that I really do think about right out of the gate when I'm meeting somebody with hypercalcemia. And we'll talk more about treatment and diagnostics, obviously. So. Yes, and I'll add those. So think about your patient age and think about the severity of their hypercalcemia. Okay, so we have our little diagnostic uh, schema. We have our labs that we would order. Um, but I want to take a pause because this guy had lots of things in his history, right, that could contribute to why he has hypercalcemia. Um, and you guys aptly picked up on a lot of them. You know, you guys are worried about malignancy, you know, maybe because I've said I'm going to be a, a hemonk <laughs> after this. So everybody thinks it's what it's going to be. But let's talk about his hypoparathyroidism history. So he had a history of Graves' disease, and for you guys to remember, Graves means that he had autoantibodies to his thyrotropin receptor, which stimulates the growth of the thyroid and results in overproduction of TSH. He had an NTT. Anybody know what that stands for? Near total thyroidectomy. Um, so if you see that abbreviation, um, that's what it means. And he also had a resection of 3.5 of his parathyroid glands and auto -impl implementation of, his, of one of his glands. And so what endocrine surgeons do is they go in, they take out the thyroid, but you can't take out all of your parathyroid um, glands. Otherwise you won't have any and you won't be able to make um, the appropriate hormones that you need. So they usually take some and actually implant it in your arm. Um, so that's what he had done. 
he had been seeing endocrinology recently, um, and he'd been adjusting his calcitriol levels. So who knows what calcitriol is? Yeah, it's basically the active form of vitamin D. So um, important for us to know because that can impact someone's calcium. Questions on his hypoparathyroidism history. Okay. We also talked about um, his pulmonary nodule. And so he had had a CAT scan done about six months prior to presentation and he had an eight millimeter um, pulmonary nodule. Now he had smoked a long time ago, um, had quit for over 15 years, but it was something under surveillance. And so the American College of Radiology will tell you that if somebody has an eight millimeter nodule, that they should get scans at least every three to six months to follow up until we see if it's growing, shrinking, you know, whatever's happening to it. And then you can go from there. So he was still pending his repeat follow-up chest CT. But just so you guys know, that was his pulmonary nodule. And then the other thing that I think that we should talk about, because oftentimes we see it in people's notes, but we're like, what is this MGUS? So um, MGUS stands for monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance. So the way that we often work these up where they get found is that somebody has a protein gap on their labs. And the way you calculate a protein gap is take your total protein minus your albumin. If it's greater than four, greater than 4.5, you really should work it up. Um, what are some things that we can check to evaluate a protein gap? Aside from just this, which I've already written down, there's some other labs that you guys should think of. Yep, free light chains. What else? Some infectious diseases that we should rule out. Yeah, perfect. So HIV, Hep C, any other liver um, issues, you know, that can always cause a protein gap. And so this guy had had all that checked. So it was all negative. Um, he had had the protein gap still, um, and with that negative workup, his PCP had checked in SPEP and free light chains. Who feels super confident about interpreting SPEPs and free light chains? Almost none of us, right? Like you get it back and you're like, what the heck does this mean? I have no clue. Let me just call him and see what they have to say. So when the SPEP is reported, um, what they do is they, you know, they run someone's serum through a gel agar and they look to see if there are bands of proteins um, that are formed. And so an SPEP is meaningful when you have a monoclonal, so one particular type of protein, um, gammopathy. So one protein that's collecting, you'll see a spike up. And so often when it's reported, you'll get an output like this. So it'll say 0 0.1 grams per decil deciliter of an IgG lambda spike if they have one. Um, oftentimes your patients with CKD, it'll say polyclonal gammopathy. You don't have to worry about that. That means that there's a variety of things that are being made, probably due to their underlying kidney or liver disease. Um, it's not a uh, monoclonal gammopathy that's coming from their bone marrow. Questions on that part? And then do you guys know where the IgG and the lambda come from? Why, like why we use those terms or what significance they play? There's two light types of light chains. There's copper and copper. Copper is on the price. Copper is on the price. Perfect. Anya is my plant. Oh, let me move this back here. Um, so we have uh, our antibodies that we make. You have a heavy chain, which is your IgG, your A, your M, D, and E, and then your light chain, which can be a kappa or a lambda. So that's why you're always going to get both of those um, reported, unless they have purely a free light chain um, issue, which we won't go into. So his PCP also checked his kappa and lambda light chains. And so we get these numbers. Um, again, it's like, oh, is this high? Is this low? What is this ratio that we're talking about? And so generally speaking, a ratio greater than um, 1.5 is something that you should kind of pay attention to and, and think about. But for patients with CKD like this patient has, you can actually have a ratio like up to three that can be considered normal. And so when you guys are looking at your kappa and lambda uh, light chains, what I want you to do is see if there's one in particular that's way out of proportion to the other one. Um, if it is, then you should investigate a little bit further. But like for this guy, they're pretty evenly matched. Um, his ratio is 1.2, so it's a little high, but not astronomical, especially given his CKD. So this is where he stands for his MGUS before he comes into the hospital. Questions on this? And I guess to be explicit, we care about MGUS because a certain percentage of them will progress onto multiple myeloma, um, and multiple myeloma obviously can cause hypercalcemia. Okay, great. So now we've dug into his history a little more. We've clarified. 
we have our diagnostic workup. And so um, Dr. Albert brought up a really good point. So this guy's calcium is 14. We're gonna send off these labs that you guys have requested, but do we wanna just sit around and wait until they come back? No. Okay, so um, with your teams, talk about what you wanna do to manage his hypercalcemia, sky's the limit. I will remind you that he has a history of heart failure and his EF is only 25%. So keep that in mind. <laughs> Planted that little uh, you know, seed for you. So um, think about what you wanna do. We will come back in about two minutes and talk about your plans. We'll start with the middle table um, when we come back. Okay, everybody, let's come back. So we will start with table two here in the middle. Okay, so table two, give me at least one thing that you want to do to manage this patient's hypercalcemia as you're admitting him. So we're mindful of his fiat. Mm -hmm. um, he does have worsening kidney function, you can kind of be 
uh, like polyuric of hypercalcemia, we did want to give them a little bit of fluid. Perfect. Okay. Not too much. <laughs> we also talked about, uh, we're going to go with normal saline. Okay. How much? A liter over two hours. A liter over two hours. We also have, yeah, we could be dehydrated too. Yeah, great. So uh, Ben's pointing on could be dehydrated. He's on a lot of diuretics. Anything else that you guys want to do for him? We also talked about calcitonin and bisphosphonates. Yeah. And so for our meds, we have calcitonin and our bisphosphonates. Table one, anything different that you guys want to do? Okay, great. Okay, so holding some of his antihypertensives and his diuretics, great. Yeah. Yep. So in, in uh, emergent situations, we can do dialysis to get rid of um, some of that calcium. Table three, anything else that you guys want to add? I have a question for you guys. Do you want to keep his calcitonin on or his calcitriol rather? Yeah, right. So um, sometimes I think that we like just like to jump and think about our uh, up to date page where we're like, oh, fluids, maybe diuretics, maybe give them uh, calcitonin or bisphosphonate. Um, but just remember your patient. So he is on a medication that will increase his calcium. Just hold it. Um, obviously, it's too high. So we'll, we'll recheck. Does anybody want to follow his labs daily? Q12, Q8. Q4. <laughs> Our uh, future uh, aggressive interventionalists over there, pants scamming and <laughs> checking labs Q2. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, checking out at least like Q8 in the beginning or Q12 um, is fine uh, for this particular patient. Okay, and then I want to point out a couple of things that Dr. Albert is bringing up. So he is saying hypercalcemia, regardless of the cause, will, will result in a nephrogenic DI. Also, his history of diarrhea and his diuretics could cause his volume depletion, worsening his hypercalcemia. Um, so excellent points there. All right, so um, you guys sent up all those labs that we talked about in the last section, and now we're gonna get into managing this guy. So I agree that we need to give him some sort of fluid and we should probably hold his diuretics and his calcitriol uh, when he comes into the ER. Now, in somebody who has heart failure and hypercalcemia, all of you should just be like a little bit more nervous than your average patient because the mainstay of treatment for him is going to be volume resuscitation and his body already, like we already know, his body can't handle massive volume resuscitation. So um, seniors, how would you um, give your fluids? Like what sorts of things would you tell your nursing staff or how would you go about the actual practice of administering fluids to this guy who has a pretty terrible EF? <laughs> yeah. And are you going to put them on maintenance fluids? You're like, all right, 200 an hour. I'll check back in tomorrow. No. Yeah. So small, frequent boluses. I agree with that hundred percent. So you should not be putting him on maintenance fluids um, with this terrible EF, you know, give him 500, give him a liter. And you should be going back to reevaluate him in person after each bolus is completed to make sure that we're not overdoing it with his volume. Because if we are, we may have to talk about that dialysis intervention if he just can't handle fluid. Okay. Yeah, gentle and slow um, resuscitation doesn't really mean anything. So you're right, being confused. You'll see that the literature will say you should be giving these patients like 200 cc's of fluid an hour to match their urine output. Um, this guy would not have handled that. He would have been in florid pulmonary edema in the ICU. Um, and I would say that he wasn't that symptomatic either. So nobody was all that con or concerned that his calcium is 14, um, but nobody's like, oh my God, get that marker in and let's get him over to the ICU. Um, we took the low and slow approach. Okay. One well, just public service announcement for Dr. Koffer and the other senior residents that are here. I think you guys, you know, our, our practice has been historically to like go bedside 
and do a volume status exam, which you definitely need to do. But half the time you're sort of hallucinating the JVP and you're like, I don't know, is EF as low as the KP is a little swollen and then there's an impulse on his neck that I'm not quite sure. I would encourage you guys who've used your point of care ultrasound before, this is a great patient to really use that as one more data point to assure yourself my patient is volume down. You can assess ultrasound JVP. You can put the probe on, you know, a donor view on the left right ventricle. You can take a look around the lungs to see if there's B lines. Um, you can look at the IVC if you're more skilled. But all of that, if you guys are playing around with the ultrasound, it doesn't take you that long. I um, mean, you know, phone a friend, phone a fellow, phone an attending, phone a senior resident. I think this is the person where you really got to get the volume status right. Um, and that's going to really inform, hey, can I go 250 an hour for my first leader or should I not? Um, and how frequently should I do this? Uh, since don't forget, point of care ultrasound can be a tool, um, not a diagnostic study, but a tool in as an extension of your stethoscope and your physical exam to figure out this person's life status. Yeah, and if you guys remember, the resident who admitted him did use the ultrasound just to figure out what his JVP was. Um, so definitely recommend it. Come grab the ultrasound anytime. So he comes in. Um, he does get volume, about two liters of normal saline over the first day that he's here. His diuretics are held, as is his calcitriol, and his morning calcium comes back at 12. And we'll say that's his corrected value. So it's coming down. Um, additionally, endocrinology was consulted. He'd been seeing them in clinic um, to try and get his calcitriol levels appropriate. So they were informed that he was here with an inappropriate cal uh, calcium level. And they said, hey, you know, his labs seem a little bit squirrely. Um, it seems like he's having this hypercalcemia. Um, it doesn't always seem like it's aligning with his PTH in clinic. So they recommended that we do that workup, um, check his PTH level, his PTHRP, his vitamin D levels. And they also recommended um, that we follow up things like his pulmonary nodule and also consider a bone scan um, to see if he had any bone lesions. So let's look at some of his images. Um, we rarely get both a PA and lateral. So I'm going to put these up for you. So I'm going to give you guys about a minute to talk with your teams. I'll get these both on the screen for you. And talk through um, his x-rays. Definitely not normal. <laughs> um, and then I'll have one person take the iPad and you can walk us through um, what you're noticing for this guy's uh, imaging. So review for about one minute with your teams. Okay, let's come back together and talk through this guy's EK or uh, chest x ray. Who wants to uh, take the first crack at drawing out what they're seeing on this guy's chest x ray? Any takers? Do you guys want to walk through it together? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, the first thing that I obviously noticed that there is some stuff there that is not there in a normal chest. So who wants to point out what is uh, not human inside of him? <laughs> yeah, so pacemaker. So that's this box right here. What a pacemaker? ICD. Great. And how do you know the difference between pacemaker and ICD? Coils. Great. So these things down here are the coils. So the leads come out of the device and then they wrap around into his chest. Um, what are all these little like white dots sort of scattered around? 
Yeah, from his cabbage. He had a four vessel cabbage. There's a lot of clips in there. Um, it's like an arts and crafts. Yeah, project. lots of stuff. Uh, <laughs> his his x-ray. And then you can see his sternotomy wires here um, in his chest. Okay, so we've identified the abnormal devices that are present. Um, remember, he has this history of heart failure. His EF was not improving after three months of goal-directed medical therapy or guideline-directed medical therapy. So the uh, ICD is placed. What about his lungs? Does he have any evidence of um, problems with volume overload in his lungs? Yeah, so he's got, it looks like somebody might be coming out to um, the periphery here. Anya's pointing out that he has an effusion on this side. I also can't see a clear border on this side. So um, radiology right as it's chronic bilateral pleural effusions. He's had these in the past. Um, Dr. Albert is saying the left atrium is enlarged. Ooh. Great. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then, um, you know, we can see in our, our uh, lateral film, you know, same thing. We're not getting the clear borders here. It looks a little bit rounded. Um, we can see his devices from this side. But yes, a very, very complicated chest x-ray. There's no huge mass that I'm seeing, um, like an infiltrating um, adenocarcinoma or something like that. But definitely, he's got a lot going on. What do you guys think about his high rate? So, like, read a study, yeah. But, like, think about why the patient here, hypercalcemia. Look at the media side of it. Look at the high rate. What do you guys see? Potentially widened the mediastinum. Yeah, right. So I mean, I think we're seeing a sort of generous feel for the upper part of the heart. You know, when you're thinking widened mediastinum in that sense, you know, this is aortic issues, whether it's aneurysm, dissection, that's, you know, your Cadmus DX is there. You know, when you have somebody presenting with hypercalcemia, you may want to think more down the sarcoid path, take a look at the hyaluron to see, do, do people have pretty significant hyaluron adenopathy? We cannot visualize this man's left column. There's too much going on. On the right side, you can see a vector of it there, right? It looks more full than we're used to seeing with a, a, a sort of a larger pulmonary artery than I typically see. So, so big PA, but what this doesn't look like is big either bulky adenopathy that we see with sarcoid and some of these other things. So I think, you know, it's great to have a system to read a study and to point out abnormalities and think about heart failure, but never lose sight of like, how, how is your differential line up with what you're trying to do, whether that's read an EKG or look at a chest x-ray. So cool, interesting. Great job reading, guys. Um, Dr. Albert points out that his um, bones look a little too dense, so he's worried about possibly a metastatic um, process going on. And so this guy actually had a whole bone survey done. Um, everything came back normal. I'm just going to show you his uh, right arm. What are these things here? <laughs> I'll zoom in. So we saw clips on his uh, chest x-ray. Why does he have clips in his arm? Parathyroid. Yeah, so that's where his parathyroid gland was reimplanted. Otherwise, his, bon his bone scan came back negative for any sort of um, bony abnormality. Okay, so let's sort of get through the rest of the management for this guy. So he comes in, um, his calcium level is coming down. Um, endocrine says, hey, because it's coming down, we're holding the calcitriol. He responded well to some fluids. We don't want to overdo it with his heart failure. Um, let's just watch him and see how he does as we hold the calcitriol a little bit longer. Um, the team says, oh, he's looking a little bit volume up. So they restart his diuretics um, at his home dose just to make sure that we're not sort of battling processes with giving him fluid and having to take it away. And so hospital day two, he suddenly has an episode of nausea, emesis. He's really not feeling well. Um, he is totally out of it in terms of how, uh, how he's doing. He like, can't even sit up and talk to you because that's how nauseous he is. So what's the first thing you guys want to do? Vitals. He's stable. So his vitals are all stable. That is the appropriate answer. He's still on his three liters of oxygen, um, which is his baseline. Yeah, so we're gonna recheck a calcium level and now it came back at 13.6. So it's going back up after we had given him those fluids and you know we've monitored him for a little while. And so this is when endocrinology says, hey, let's start his calcitriol or let's start some calcitonin while we hold his calcitriol. So he gets calcitonin. Anybody wanna take a guess on the dose? 
Four. <laughs> Four is an answer. Um, but he's actually going to get it's 200 milligrams uh, IV um, because he's not—he's feeling really terrible and can't even take anything um, by mouth. So we're going to give him stuff IV. Um, we gave him a little bit of fluid to replace what he had lost with his diuretics. And we kept the calcitonin going um, until his serum calcium was less than 12. And so it took him two doses to get there. And then by hospital day number three, his calcium had dropped down to the 11s. So now is about the time when we're getting all of our labs back. So I'm gonna pull them up for you. And so here are the labs that were checked. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to look over those. And then I'll ask for one brave soul to help us interpret his labs. All right, so do I have one volunteer to help us walk through his labs that have now come back? Okay, so we'll take it one step at a time. So this is this is hypercalcemia, a PTH mediated process, yes or no? No, his PTH level is undetectable as it should be if it's working appropriately. So we know that he does not have a primary hyperparathyroidism, which is good because did most of them removed. So likely not the case. Okay, so we've crossed that off. Now, what were, what were we going to look at next? Our PTHRP, right? So it's not PTH mediated. We look at our PTHRP. It's less than two. So that must mean it is low, right? It's not a PTHRP mediated process. So this guy probably doesn't have you know, some sort of raging malignancy going on. Then we're gonna check um, our 125 vitamin D. Anybody have an idea of where the 8.2 lands? Guess high or low, 50% chance of being right? Correct, it is low. And then we also checked a total vitamin D to make sure you know his multivitamin wasn't putting him over the edge. Um, that is also normal. And then we checked a couple other things. So if you remember, he's also on levothyroxine. If they have hyperthyroidism, that can also cause hypercalcemia. His level was appropriate. It's not like he was overdoing it on his levothyroxine at home. And then adrenal insufficiency can also cause um, hypercalcemia. So his level was normal for a morning cortisol. So that was also all good. So now, where do we go? Hey, he did have an SPEP and a free light chains checked and those were stable from his prior SPEP and free light chains. So why did this guy have hypercalcemia? Yeah, so um, we went through a very interesting process. Roxanne actually also took care of this patient. He had all the things in the world to argue for a possible um, non-PTH mediated process for his hypercalcemia. He had his endgut, pulmonary nodule, he had you know, all those other things going on, but turns out that wasn't the cause of any of his hypercalcemia. It was just, he was on too much calcitriol with his worsening renal function in combination with his diuretics. And so that's why his levels kept sort of spiking up. And so he was thought as an outpatient, his calcitriol doses decreased, his UMX dose, even though it was actually way too high for him, he was diuresing like four liters a day. Um, and so that was actually the cause of his hypercalcemia. So everything that we were doing to him and nothing that his own body is doing. Okay, questions on this case? Great job today, guys. Um, tomorrow, Jason will cover conference and uh, Wednesday we'll have an M&M with Michelle. Thursday, we'll see you in a case.
And then Friday, we'll play Jeopardy. There will be prizes. Come and hang out. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.